Chapter 4, Jewish Fables by E. Michael Jones. Another short one, only three pages or so. Genesis and Evolution. Verschuren's attempt to reconcile Genesis and Evolution leads him, unfortunately, into a platonic dualism, dualism which allows a previously existent spiritual soul to inhabit a previously existing biological body. When he tells us that the bodies of human creatures must have been apt to receive a human soul, which includes the right genes and the proper brains. If the soul is a form of the body, it is difficult to understand how a body could exist without its form. Plato felt that a pre-existent soul inhabited a material body in the same manner in which a pilot was in a ship. If the soul is its form, the body is not an empty vessel waiting to be filled by a soul, in the sense that a car sits fully formed in the driveway waiting for a driver. The human body is an expression of the human soul. It had to be created with that expression in mind. It could not exist apart from its existence as the material expression of the soul's first act of rationality, speech, etc. The idea that at some point in time there were physical human beings with animal souls is simply untenable and flies in the face of any sophisticated understanding of what the soul is and how it reacts. And how it acts, excuse me. The first man's body, therefore, had to be a special act of creation every bit as much as the creation of the first man's soul was because, according to Aristotle's more sophisticated understanding of their relationship, neither soul nor body can exist independently of the other. Either way, science cannot document the emergence of man. The first man may have resembled other hominids at this time even more closely than we resemble apes in our day. But both his body and soul were of a fundamentally different nature and could only have come into being as a special act of creation, which will remain forever undocumentable to science. Pope John Paul II claimed that the more of passage into the spiritual realm is not something that can be observed with research in the fields of physics and chemistry. His immediate successor made that moment even less accessible to science by identifying it with the first word of human speech. Like St. John the, the Evangelist, Pope Benef Benedict the Sixteenth believes that the beginning of mankind was identical with man's utterance of the first word. Quote, the clay became man at the moment in which a being for the first time was capable of forming, however dimly, the thought of God. The first thou that, however stammeringly, was said by human lips to God, marks the moment in which the spirit arose in the world. Here the Rubicon of anthropogenesis was crossed. For it is not the use of weapons or fire, not new methods of cruelty or of useful activity that constitute man, but rather his ability to be immediately in relation to God. This holds fast to the doctrine of the special creation of man. Herein lies the reason why the moment of anthropogenesis cannot possibly be determined by paleontology. Anthropogenesis is the rise of the spirit, which cannot be excavated with a shovel. End quote. Certain things follow from this conclusion. First of all, there is no such thing as history without logos. In order to write his history, Harari must periodically abandon his materialism because, as even he has figured out, animals do not have histories because they do not have reason. The lives of dogs do not combine to create a history that spans centuries or millennia, which is the scope of sapiens. The lives of dogs do nothing more than recapitulate each other in the opposite direction until they finally collapse into one life which recapitulates the life of the species. Man is the only creature on this earth which has a history because he is the only creature on this earth that is rational. Rationality allows man to discern patterns in the changing flux of temporal events. It also allows him to discuss these patterns with other men and eventually to write them down so that future generations of rational creatures can discuss them as well. There can be, therefore, no history without rationality. To get around the contradictory and equivocal nature of his understanding of language, Harari creates the idea of fictions, which involve the ability to transmit information about things that do not exist at all. The ability to speak about things which do not exist is the most unique feature of sapien language. That concludes chapter four of Jewish Fables by Dr. E. Michael Jones.